Hello. Button. There it goes. Okay, so hi, this is Coffee Compiler Club. Um, uh, anything to do with compilers, language runtimes, garbage collections, concurrency, typing systems, uh, you know, pointers and null checks, and I don't know what all. It's all fair game. Um, thanks, Frederick. Uh, and, and you're being recorded, and in theory, it goes up on YouTube within a day or two. And if you don't like that, bail out now. And I ask you to mute your mic when you're not talking so we don't have, you know, 15, 20 people all have background noise. I reserve the right to moderate, never had to do it. Uh, that's it, that's my starting spiel. And after that, we're, we're fair game for whatever anyone wants to talk about. Um, I have a, a little bit of, of news that showed up in YouTube channel comments, which I don't get if they get a wide read. And that's, um, let's see, Matt Brown did a bunch of uh, uh, survey work on uh, SIMD instructions that were generated and used and found they were uh, under 1%. Um, you know, this is a sort of modern optimizing compiler on some, I think, Linux version of OS. And I think that the easy, and then you have further comments. So it was very hard to both generate them and have them get used in a meaningful way. That's been my experience as well. The, the usual story is you're out of memory bandwidth. And, and back in the day in high, high performance computing, we'd call it the, the memory compute balance. You had more memory, you had more more compute available than you had memory bandwidth available. So you didn't need anything special to get it. You just need to get it in from memory and then you could do whatever you, how you wanted with generic instructions. Um, we talked about short basic block lengths and, and like generic junk Java code. The typical basic block length is four or five ops. Uh, and it's five if you're using a memory op to double as a null pointer exception, check. And otherwise it's like, four and then you have a branch so they're really tiny basic blocks and that's just you know the nature of compute for the last 20 years has been do a little tiny bit of testing something and that lets you test a little more and test a little more and test a little more and after a long time you do a meaningful change involving like a store and you change your memory state or something otherwise you're just doing tests of of what's going on to diagnose the situation before you can do anything. So using SIMD instructions are hard or Linux? No, using SIMD instructions is a symptomatic of the, you got more memory bandwidth and, and you need complicated compute, not simple. Like SIMD ops says, I'm doing a whole lot of the same thing 
to a lot of stuff. And as soon as I said a lot of stuff, I ran out of memory bandwidth. So it didn't matter if I were doing the same thing or different. So it's like there are codecs for which it works and makes sense because you have a lot more compute for like video compression, audio compression, but the sort of normal everyday, what I call generic junk Java code, generic junk C code, you don't need, you don't need anything fancy. Normally structuring, structuring the core to use the same instructions is hard, more hard. And if, if they're, like you said, if they're much of repetitive work, it's easy to structure the code in the CMD. But otherwise, it's become hard. Yeah, right. Yeah, Java, Java uh, C2 will omit them, but the amount of hoops you have to jump through is pretty damn huge. Um, and can you rely to emit them uh, consistently? We, we we don't admit them unless we think they'll they'll work, which is a very narrow set of circumstances. So when the code gets emitted, it will probably fire off correctly and and, and use them. That they'll that'll actually happen because you get profiling. You know the loop trip count. They get to profile the loop because the trip count's big enough, and you shouldn't bother. Uh, it's, cool. it's digit. It's, if it's the digit, it's maybe it's easier, but uh, because if you are, are co compiling in a binary, you have to emit both the code, both the SIMD code and the normal code. The well, you can roll back just. Right. We emit both anyhow, typically anyhow, because you do a um, short trip count test, you do range checks, which also amounts to short trip count tests on either end of the loop. You have to align the loop to cache line boundaries typically to be worth it. So there's a pre-loop that does any iterations less than like eight for your short and also, you know, aligns and also does underflow checks. <clears throat> and, and if your loop is short, you ran the pre-loop anyhow and you were done. And if it was longer, then you got into the main loop and you had to go like four or eight iterations in the main loop before it paid off. So yeah, there's a lot of a uh, lot of barriers to making it functionally useful, and then and then like I said before, you're, you're still out of bandwidth. If you're really long, you're just out of bandwidth. So your your data has to be small enough to fit in some layer of cache hierarchy, be repeated so the cache does something useful, do the same thing so that you can run a SIMD op on it. You know, how you jump through all the hoops, you know, maybe. <laughs> Lately, I have uh, seen that. Uh... Uh, some guys try to perform parsing with SIMD, like uh, integer parsing and double parsing, which is considerably harder. Yeah. Parsing? And, uh, uh, double parsing from string with yeah. SIMD instructions oh, and integer yeah. parsing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there was a guy, a professor at some university, I will throw a link there. He, yeah, yeah, but he open source his work. Right, but, but how the, the deal with parsing is you typically touch once. So you're you're out of memory bandwidth. That, that's also true, but you he wants to try to yeah, try to right. push the parsing as fast as possible. Right. Oh, yeah. H2O will do you know terabyte CSV file parsing where we'll typically run your your disks at their max disk bandwidth and not do the stock. But if you can hit from OS caches, they'll run your OS cache drives. I can parse giant CSV files in parallel at something ludicrous like like you know two gigs, three gigs a second. Um, but that only comes out of your out of your OS caches because that's you know faster than your disk will spin. In the link I shared, they're yeah. claiming they're parsing at one gigabit per second uh, from the file from right, file. right. I'm re I'm parsing more than that without using SIMD because uh, you got cycles, you're just burning cycles. Drowning in now, this might be single threaded. I'm doing it parallel, so you know. Yeah, it's in one machine. It's on one no, machine. no, no, one, one, one machine parallel. I'm getting that, those numbers. You scale numbers by count of machine because everyone's got their own VM. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. We certainly, you know, eat CSV files, and that's pushing. Kirk, you're, you're, screen and your background are doing crazy things. There you go. And your sound. I see your mouth moving and no sound. Yeah. 
Sorry, I was just cleaning my screen, so just ignore me for a minute. Ah, okay, that makes more sense. Because I was laying it flat so the liquid wouldn't roll in unwanted places. And you poured liquid on your screen, why? Oh, never mind. Uh, well, because it's, uh, I don't know. Shit, don't worry about it. Because it's easier to clean it that way. Oh, you actually put water on. Oh my goodness. No, not water. Well, but just like a like a glass cleaner. Yeah, something. Yeah. But but I've already had enough liquid accidents this morning, so I don't want any more. Okay. Don't uh, don't let's not talk about that. Sorry to disrupt. Continue. I'm listening. Uh, we were continuing a short conversation about basic box length and generic junk java code and the value of symbiops. And that was all I had on that thread. Someone wanted to ask something or carry on something or... I um, don't have any other real news. I set aside my, my SQL hacking and I'm back to doing AA things. Which, which ended up okay. with me being able to run TPCH queries on an H2O instance as fast or faster than the fastest known databases. Although I'm not a database, so I don't have any, you know, I get to take a bunch of shortcuts maybe that are TD. Um, but I-, I Does that get, assume the whole data set fits in memory? Uh, yes, this assumes the whole data set fits in memory. Otherwise you're at the same speed as everyone's disk is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, does it, yeah. Does okay. So I mean, I don't want to switch topics too badly, but um, I'm going to make an attempt anyways. Um, does anyone uh, have any idea or what the state of uh, value types or what they currently call them are now in Java? In Java, think speaking of uh, memory efficiency, data structure type things. I do not. I'm hoping someone else will chime in. The inline type support, there's a couple of JEPs that were opened in the last, I don't know, six months about mm -hmm. uh, defining what the inline types look like. And I think the definition for the inline types themselves is pretty stable. Um, the next major piece being focused on right now is how to handle generics over these specialized types. So it's a lot of um, investigation into um, class specialization and how to do that properly. I'll okay. see if I can pick up a, a link for a second. Yeah, I was actually hoping that we would be seeing something significant by JDK 17, but it, I, it would appear now that that's simply not going to happen, which means really it's only 23 when we're going to see something that might make a difference, right? Oh, what's the cadence of the releases now? Well, it's six months, every six months, but the, so, you know, the, but people tend to focus on LTS or the long-term support, which is like every three years. Okay. And uh, which means that, you know, stuff gets dumped in every, uh, every six months. Uh, but really, you know, since for production reasons, they want uh, like a long-term support, then, you know, people don't like migrating that quickly and all that, you know, it's really going to be like 23 before the next LTS comes out, right? Uh, yeah, why, why they are splitting that uh, JDK 11, 15, 16, why they are so marketing product lines? 17 is supposed to be an LTS. Yeah, 17 is an LTS. Yeah, and the next Which, one should be 23. Yeah, you're right. But yeah, that. but that really means that if the, uh, if the JEP is not in the queue, yeah. then now, it's not getting in because, you know, they'll do a code freeze in June sometime, right? For the release in September. Now. Yep. What is yeah, the I don't, I don't think there's any the VM that is preventing people from upgrading the VM every six months? Nothing except for institutional resistance. I know to be entirely fair, you get a complicated set of performance metrics in place and running somebody changes any slightest stupid thing and suddenly your performance goes to hell in a handbasket. Like I assume the breakage quit happening a while ago. It used to be that you could just flip to the new JVM and your code would simply break. Now it simply has performance potholes that come and go and, and, and you don't need it. So yeah, I which claim- Which one is carrier? Which one I, is carrier? 
yeah, there's no there's no gain to upgrade my my working production system, and there's high risk. Right. Traditionally, so, high risk. risk level may be dropping, but traditionally, it's been high risk. Yeah. So um, I think what you've done is you've so it's unboxed what I was saying is like institutional resistance, right? Okay. Fine. Uh, yeah. Or. Or, well, I, I claim is it's, the institutional resistance carries this negative, useless negative connotation. I claim there's an actual risk management strategy going on in place here. Yeah, sure. I mean, but that's part of the resistance, uh, okay. right? That's there's institutionalized and everything like that. I mean, risk right. management is, I mean, it, it, it's for sure, it's it's a real issue. Like you said, it's like, you know, um, I, I mean, what was the biggest problem getting eight to 11 or eight to nine was really, it, I mean, the code change, nah, you know, it's, yeah, you know, a little bit here and there, but not that big a deal. It was all of the breaking infra, the things that did that broke all of the infrastructure. That was the biggest problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think it was probably even a bigger problem than um, being held back because frameworks weren't um, migrating. Well, the frameworks mi weren't migrating because they were suffering from the same problems also. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's like you just broke everybody's infrastructure, and um, but I. Well, I think the Python two to three transition taught us that even tiny code changes can be very expensive. Yeah. Yeah, but they were not tiny. Oh. They, yeah, yeah. Python Python was a hard break. Lots of lots of shit broke. Yeah, and it and it's a dynamic language, so. You found times the ten. Yeah, you found the break. Time, time right. yeah. Okay. Yeah, when you're making money and suddenly. What, yeah. what happened? <laughs> right. Yeah, it kind of sucked because I thought the changes were good, but boy, they, they, I don't know. But I had the other issues with the Python community and they're not not willing to make a change. They made a change from two to three, but didn't make a change to let them do a JIT. And I thought that was stupid, that there are some minor things and you can go ask all the different Python JITing codes out there what it would take. And there's some minor things they could have done and they should have done them in two to three. And then... Do you have specific examples of what makes it unjittable? I, I would have to go pull it up. PyPy exists. Yeah, no, no, but you go ask PyPy. Why is PyPy not the next generation Python, but it's PyPy? It's because it's not compatible directly 100% with the current Python. Now you go it's ask a PyPy. Subset and they'll, of Python. They'll, it's they'll a subset tell you. of Python. Yeah, yeah. They'll tell you what it is. It's not too much. It's a little tiny shit, but it's not the next generation Python. It's PyPy. I went and did this math many years ago, and then I like poked at them, and they were like, "No, nah, we're not interested." Did, did someone look at uh, PHP JIT? Right? It, at eight, PHP eight has a JIT compiler now. Someone has to look at it. Oh, I have to go actually find the GitHub PHP, the Facebook thing. Yeah. No, no, PHP 8 has a JIT compiler. Oh, no, PHP, PHP 8. Not, not hip hop. I thought it was right, hip hop. PHP 8 comes with a, with, with a JIT compiler now. I haven't seen it, but I'm oh. curious if I someone need, has. You need to find the official PyPy page. Here. What is PyPy? Da, 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 da. Here's the the um, here's the the Python compatibility from PyPy. I'll throw that in the link here. But it says shit like de destructors are not run in the same uh, sequence and ordering as the main Python. Uh, they can be delayed indefinitely. Makes a lot of sense. Um, there's ref counting semantics that are not done. There's something to the GC that's a little different. I won't. I won't read it all now. Fine. And it's still to Python two point seven compatibility. Oh, it's still Python two seven. I bet you no. Python Pi Pi three implements three seven nine. Yeah, yeah just so it. Yeah. Oh, and it's been released, and they're saying weasel words. It's a large language, and quite possible a few things are missing. That's a common way of saying it's in beta, or whatever you want to call it. It's an early release. All right, cat. Fine. Uh, yeah, OK, fine. What else? PyPy compatibility. 
So what's next for AA in the type system, maybe? Oh, I, 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 am, I am sorting out the actual, I, I, I'm be, still beating down the, the interaction between, uh, mostly interaction between uh, Henry Milner and forward flow typing. And I'm like, it's like implementation details and I set it aside for several weeks. So I'm, I'm finding again where I left off. Uh, and they all seem straightforward. So I think I'm going to get it. Uh, but I'm not there because I set it aside for show. Actually, I set it aside for more than a month. Um, it's a good paying gig, but I'm back to doing AA things. So just, just last couple of days. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that I'll have the, the thing nailed down by sometime in one to two weeks from now, because I think I actually have only a handful of places where it's where I'm not doing the absolute right thing. Um, and then I'll start to get to explore the space of what it buys me. So, uh, so far the type system tracks are primitive types and are memory types as we speak. Yeah, yeah. In so the, the, the forward flow typing has a precise memory type, precise primitive types, precise types for function arguments, except it doesn't, it doesn't do uh, uh, sharing of type variables doesn't have type variables, which is the Henley Milner. So Henley Milner brings in type variables, but I get to have precise primitives that are flow analyzed along with precise type variables, which are done with Henley Milner style. So bools are a subclass of int in the, in the forward flow typing and in classic Henley Milner bools and ints shall never meet. Um, but for me, they can just be one's a subtype of the other, and I don't care. So, Same for so they can implicitly convert uh, without the user there, there is no distinction between them in the lattice system. It's ambiguous. So your bool is just an int one. Yes. Like C plus plus. Uh, I guess I don't know. It, so it, I, I believe comparison thirty two. I, I have oh, yeah. you know int of some count of bits. They're all obviously subclassed in the way they do. They can be precisely typed. You can demand a bool and return a bool, and I'll flow bools exactly where you expect one a bool. But I can silently coerce a bool to an int, and an int of sufficiently narrow range is actually typed as a bool directly. I was talking about uh, the C++. If you do a comparison, the result is an int, a zero. If it's yes. true, if false, or once if true. Yes, so, so I, I do that coercion because I like that style. If you compare two things to get a bool result, you get a bool result, which also happens to be ambiguously a small, an int one. I believe it lends to a more performant code, but just uh, this is just my opinion. If it's a uh, it bool is an int. It, it, yeah, it, it, well, it leads always the optimizer. Like in Java, bool is an, a separate type from int. But the conversions from bool to hardware instructions, which compare ints only, is like completely sort of perfectly done and it should be perfectly done by pretty much any compiler. So I don't think there's any performance cost, but there is a, a, an extra bit of code I end up writing kind of often happens where I say bool question mark zero colon one, right? And I don't have to do that no more, right? That, that's Such the a point. Coincidence. I have dealt. I have dealt recently with this, and the point is to compare to compile it to a C move, to a conditional move, and not to a branch. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not right. So C moves in in Hotspot are pulled out by looking at the structure of the things, and they don't have anything to do with bool or int. If I see a comparison, you know, and it was converted to an int first or it didn't, then it's all it all washes out in the same. That's the optimizer under the hood. But if I'm writing a thing like I'm doing a hash and you have a value or you don't, then the hash value is zero or one. I write that kind of stupid thing. It just shows up, you know, half a dozen times, whatever. It's, it's, it's in the code all over the place. Not huge, but it's there. So I just like that. It's just a int. I don't care. I'm going to treat it like an int anyhow. It's going to type it. If I say I want a bool, I want to pass a bool and take a bool, I can totally type it that way. And then that's fine. But it silently is also an int. So I was wondering in AA, have you thought about how you deal with the interface between unsafe code and safe code? 
I've thought about it and I haven't gotten too far. I want to be able to do sort of like OS level work. So I have to play the unsafe game. Um, you know, Rust done a bunch of work there. Java kind of got it, did it first and did it a little clunky because they were first. So like there's a better answer, but I don't have a great answer. The, yeah, you want to have some kind of runtime type checking when you yeah. go from unsafe code back into safe land, but. Right, so, well, the, the, there's another thing. I want to be able to say the following code is known to have no unsafe. So I can type it as like, I'm, I'm running a server, I'm taking generic code over the, over the line. I'm reading bytes from the internet and I'm executing them. I will type it as a type that has no unsafe bits in it. So there's that aspect. Um, as opposed to hiding unsafe from you, which, you know, Java like hides the unsafe from you, except that you can get at it too easily. And so it's not really hidden, you know, that for every key, there's a very lock, there's a key and you just unlock all the locks and you got the unsafe. Now you break security. And so your Java server can be, you know, toastified anytime you want. Um, so I want to have a type that says no unsafe. I want to have, therefore there's a lexical scope that says unsafe happens here and exits here. But then everything it calls this has to deal with, I, I'm touching unsafe. Okay, fine. So at the base, there's a trusted computing code. So it's not really unsafe, it's trusted computing code. Um, so so the, the compiler runtime language built-ins will have a trusted computing code. There's people who want to do unsafe things that are outside the trusted computing code base. Uh, I want to let you do that and declare yourself as being untrusted. Fine, I'm running a device driver until I get into the trusted computing base. I'm, I'm, I'm unsafe. That's just the way it is. But I almost uh, want two different concepts of unsafe. I want yeah. one, this is my trusted computing base. Assume that it does the right thing. And yeah. I want one, this is a thing that came from the network. Assume that it's as evil as possible. Right. Validate everything before you let it into your type. Yeah, let's see. The, the done that validates everything doesn't need an unsafe because I'm going to have all the normal accesses available in the usual kind of ways. So, you, so the, you know, one of the lessons we learned at Java is you want a CAS instruction as a built into the language. Okay, fine. So there's a CAS going to be built into the language. That's not an unsafe access. What's an unsafe access that you would use in an evil way that you would want to do, not in an evil way, that's, that's, uh, 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 that you want to test for that you're, you know, that the language didn't provide you. If I look at Java, I do non-blocking hash map. I have to do unsafe for CAS. I, I, you know, I'm using unsafe to get out array indices to do CAS on array elements, but this is just because the language didn't provide me a CAS on array elements. Should have provided CAS on array elements from the get go. Okay, fine. Get rid of that piece. There are some ordering things. I want to have very carefully constrained order requirements so I can say more or less ordering for more or less cost in different places. That should just been included in the language. Okay, if I go to H2O, I do. Uh, big byte arrays where I'm reading things as ints or as longs or as shorts or as three byte things or whatever. And I use x86 misaligned memory ops. That's a little dicier. You know, is that unsafe or should that be provided as part of the language? I don't know. Go outside of that domain. I am not generically peeking and poking random memory with my unsafe accesses. How about network direct access on network byte buffers? which are outside your heap. I think that one should also now be pondered as being pushed into the language spec somehow, where I have a chunk of memory that is managed also by the OS as well as by the, the runtime. And, and now it's not unsafe either. So at some point, what, what is the evil thing that you need to do with your unsafe that the language disallows you? Besides being a, a hacker dude who wants to break security. So ignoring that model. So, so I claim I should be able to provide you with all the things you need unsafe for. So I'm, I'm serialization and, and deserialization is usually the other one. Um, maybe. I, 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 that's a good one. Um, in the H2O case, I JIT code for it. Um, and I, you know, therefore, the, the, the code gets hit with the verifier. Um, and I'm storing over final fields with unsafe. That's fair. And in AA, I have a way to do a deserialization of final fields without cheating. You, you have a final store instead of a final field. 
So you, you can you can have a mutable thing that's mutable up until you're done with construction, do a final store, and then it's no longer mutable, and then you're done. Yeah, serialization. Do you do something to prevent? I was going to say it's definitely a pretty big design area to, yeah, with your, in terms of the, uh, you know, if if you start with a Java model, you're you're going to require something that's unsafe. Yeah. Yeah, H2O does really fast, really good, nice serialization without any extra overheads or bits. You, you just say, give me an object over there and, and it serializes and deserializes. But there's a lot of magic goes on under the hood to make that work. In particular, every time I see a new class, I go build a shadow class. That's the serializer, deserializer for the new class. And then I cache them all. So the next time you ask for that class to be serialized and deserialized, you, you don't have to jit a shadow class. But you have a, I don't know what you would call it, a mirror class or shadow class or whatever. There's a. Do you have trade-offs there between being more generic and having more classes? Like, how do you prevent a combinatorial explosion of like, here's every Well, you just doubled your classes. Yeah. You didn't combinatorially explode them. Well, I was thinking of the sort of JavaScript problem where people keep adding an additional field to their classes, and then that's a new kind of class, and they add one more field, and it's ah, classes. So yeah, this is sure not people aren't using classes as maps. Right. This is not. This is not JavaScript model where you add a field and you get a new class. So I, I'm kind of in the zone of the objects are statically sized, so that you don't get to add a field, but you can make another class that had extends a prior one, but you did so directly. And you could argue that the JavaScript model of add a field has some power to it and you want to do it. And I'm, you know, of the opinion that that seems like a, an easy way to lose performance for less amounts of gain. And I would like to believe there's a better way to or, or, or people could pay the price, which is not a high price to not just add a field. How does your serializer scheme handle private fields? Same as any other. I generate a, a in the Java one, a gen, not AA, in the Java version of the world, I generate a shadow class that does unsafe things. Okay. So it does fall back to needing unsafe to to break the access restrictions. The, right, the class has a final field. The deserializer has to store into a final field. So the deserializer has a unsafe store on a you know blank object. I, I go, actually, I keep, a, I keep an object lying around, an uninitialized, empty, all zeros object lying around. I clone it, and then I start storing into it. I could have done a new allocation and then, but then to do a new allocation, I'd have to call the new constructor uh, followed by, I get complaints by, you don't have a no args constructor. So clone doesn't complain about having a no args constructor. It just like, here you go. So I have a <laughs> blank version I got at the start of the world without any weird things. And then I zero it and zero it. I fill it from unsafe with unsafe. So I am using unsafe for deserialization. But you're getting around the use after free problem by zeroing at the beginning. Uh, my original clone is zeroed. And then I clone a zero thing. Every time I deserialize the object, I clone it. I, I make a, I, I go to, I have a golden clone, zero clone, or whatever, a, a golden instance that I clone from. No one, no one points to it except it's, secretly held by the shadow class. And the shadow class goes to a clone, calls clone on it, calls it unsafe after that. They emits code to clone unsafe store fields, unsafe load from the network byte buffer, unsafe store into, and I use not the unsafe calls where it's actually possible, but if it's required, I do unsafe. So I might as well just I'm just unsafe and, and fill it in. Uh, and then because it's, you know, H2O, there's a lot of compression going on in both directions. So when I stored it into the network byte buffer to ship it over the wire, I did a lot of compression strategies 
that were baked into the structure of the of the object. I looked at the object itself and declared this is a compression strategy based on what I see in the objects class. So the shadow class then has a known decompression strategy for both sides of the wire, and he skips all the compression overhead things because every saw everybody on both sides understands what the compression strategy is going to be. So you get a really tight compression strategy. Mm. Yeah. How do you manage transients? They are specifically not serialized and deserialized. They come back with the wire is empty, is null on the other side. And in fact, that's sort of uh, uh, made explicit and done that way specifically because you have things like I have a node local concurrent hash table. Everyone on the node is sharing it and they're piling in to find uniques, but I can't, uh, uh, it's not. It's not the same hash on the other side, which has their own different node local thing. So those are all declared transient and, and you do them with a reduction step, for instance. They're, they're done a different way. So transients are specifically not serialized, just as transient says it's supposed to do. Yeah, we have a uh, constructor that takes the structure of the object and that gets around all of the annoyances of trying to poke in private fields. You have a and, you have a generic make me an ins make me this uh, reflection version that says make me an object of this class. And here are all the here are all the arguments to the fields. Well, specifically, class has a construct that takes the structure of the class. I, I would have said. If I name structure class, meaning, what do you mean by structure? Yeah, exactly. I have a person class mm -hmm. that is the structure of the class. No. Okay. That's the understand. class. Yes. So in C, I have struct. Uh huh. I say struct. I give it a name. I open it's a curly. A, it's a pure data. Pure data. It's pure That's data. True. Yeah. Right. So we don't have structs. So we have a class called struct, which does the equivalent. <laughs> So we have a we have a pure data struct. Okay. And um, all objects are created by taking that struct and then allocating an object from that struct. And so we just happen to expose that constructor via the class. It means that it reserves the amount of memory needed to allocate the struct. I believe. Somebody has to allocate. Well, generally speaking, the struct is the object, but that's not surfaced in the language. So you can't see that optimization that's actually happening behind the scenes. So when you're, when you're called to construct a I class, yeah. so the constructor itself is handed a this, but it's not a this object, it's a this struct. How, how do you, how, I got you. And actually I'm doing something very similar in AA now that you've said that that way. Cool. The constructor for a, a, a person will take a, a, an object who has the same fields, names, and layouts as a person and will add a person tag onto it. And, or you, know, you get a couple of default constructors and you can ask for more and get rid of some, whatever. The default constructors are take a thing that has all the fields of a person and add a person tag to it. Or here's all the fields of a person, and I will under the hood allocate that very struct and fill all the fields in and put the person tag on it. Right. So, so basically, tags exist in the headers of the object, or is there a V table? No, I'm going to need a V table. I'm not to implementation, but I, in, I intend to support subtyping because I can do something similar to subtyping in the lattice theory. So subtyping in a in, in Henley Milner, uh, but I'm going to need a V table. And for us, the private public protected is just different V tables. Right. But if I started with, if I handed you the struct, then I have an instance of the struct, same as a string problem, right? I have an instance that I can go do horrible things with anytime I want, right? Yeah, but we have immutability as a first class citizen. So that's not oh. a problem. Oh, you, you're saying I'll take an immutable struct, which well, gets you found. Can private, but doesn't let me change it. I have an immutable struct that has public access to everything because I 
made it, and but I know what's in it. Maybe it doesn't so matter. So if the it, if yeah. the object is immutable and you get the struct for the object, then you have an immutable struct. So you cannot use struct to get around immutability. No, I was wondering if you use struct to get around privacy, but not yet. So, excuse me. So um, you can't. It's, if it's not your type system, you can't just willy nilly get around the. Uh, you can't just get a struct for something that's not not your type system. So for example, if you wrote a serialization package, you couldn't just serialize any arbitrary object by getting it struct. Your serialization package would have to be part of the type system that introduces that, that class. Otherwise, you couldn't access its struct. Otherwise, you, you, you're, you're bound by the rules of accessing the class, which has to honor private and all that. So within your own type system, anything yeah, introduced gotcha. within your own type system, you have full access to the privates. There's no unsafe. Gotcha. So keep in mind, public private protected isn't to protect. It's not a security feature. It's an organization feature. Yeah. It's a way of hiding things from yourself, not yeah. protecting you from yourself. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think we had that conversation before. Yeah, but it's fine repeated. It's yeah, short so, and easy. Good. so private is not a security feature. Anyone who uses private as a security feature, do not ever use their software because it is by definition it, insecure. Yeah, it's not scary. It was fine. Okay, right, right. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right, that makes some sense. So, um, so when we, we do, do construction- You have to store secrets in memory somewhere. Say again? You do have to store secrets in memory somewhere. The, the, who is you though? That's the, that's the question. Who is you? When you say you have to s store secrets in memory, who's you? There's lots of yous. Yeah. Just because you store secrets in memory doesn't mean that you, the other you, can see the you's secrets, right? So, so. But the, the point is how you hide it from the other yous. Yeah, he's saying don't use private to hide your secrets. Right. There's some other exactly. way to hide secrets that needs to be figured out. And private is not so there has to be some domain, some some surface yeah. Yeah. behind which you cannot see. Yeah. Right. So what is the yeah. what is the complexity in a language of providing that opacity? Right? That's the question. If you're in a pure functional language, things in a closure are hidden from everyone else. Right. And and the the borders or what are exposed or whatever your function will take as an argument and return as a result. And all things inside are Hidden. Scala has some tricks that with macros you can extract uh, the, uh, the parameters captured by the closure. You you're, you can certainly break. You can certainly arrange for that model to be broken. But if you're looking at a pure lambda calculus, like the straight out of math and no no implementation, you're just out of math. You can't get at the guts. Okay, now if I have an implementation. All implementations can start by saying you can't get at the gods, but they could also break that and say, I allow you to get at with, you know, Java reflection can get at the gods. Yeah, but, but, but Lambda Calculus is more of a substitution thing. They are hided by a substitution uh, principle. The object oriented programming language has a more features in it and it has to make some compromises between them, between the how you hide the things. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just saying you were, camera was asking for what is the surface, the language manifest that you can use to truly hide the, the, the secret key, right? And I was throwing out, hey, if we went to pure, pure lambda calculus, it starts with a very small interface with a complete hiding of the insides. Is that a useful programming language? Well, no one ever writes in pure lambda calculus. Okay, so now you have to expand, right? So go to scheme. Well, Scheme's actually still pretty pure and probably does okay. Go to Scala. Well, Scala has all kinds of holes, independent of using like the JVM unsafe to break into things. Scala's got a lot of holes all by itself. So what's the such right- as, Such as one hole might be. I mean, you just told me one. Mm -hmm. the, the main yeah. hole for me, in my opinion, is that the incredible complexity means that I cannot verify there ain't no other holes. <laughs> but maybe there's not. Okay. 
you, you can call me a task on that one. Uh, by the way, I did watch the, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen his presentation uh, on types from 2013. I just watched it this week. Oh my God, he's such a good speaker. The Mark Arderski? Guy. Yes, brilliant, yeah. freaking brilliant. He's a good guy. Let me see if I can find a link while you're talking. I'll post it. Oh, yeah, yeah. If he's very capable, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah very, very much so. Yeah. He, he has done uh, Java generics, I think, I believe, that the basis that become Java C. Yeah, he was still there at the time, but I think it was mainly Josh Block. I, yeah, I thought it was Josh Block that did that. Uh, but it, probably Martin chimed in. I, I imagine those two went back and forth a bunch. There was a lot of chiming in, if I recall correctly. Yeah, and, I can believe uh, it. Yeah, but well, they had a tough call to make to backwardsly fit generics into JVM. Well, they implemented it both ways. I don't yeah, know. I they they actually it was a language designed called PISA. That was the precursor yeah. for the yeah. Java yeah. yeah, yeah. That was the precursor for Scala. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Java with pattern matching almost and the generics, I believe. God, I remember Josh being chased by, I don't know who was like, it's almost like he needed bodyguards at Java one one year. Yeah. Because of yeah. the generic thing. Yeah. Yeah. Type erasure was pissing off some people. Oh, big but, time. But they yeah. had some serious problems they had to choose between. And I, I think he made a reasonable call. And you could reasonably argue it should have gone the other way, but that's a that's a that's a passion point for a lot of folks. Actually, they really wound up. I did write an editorial on the subject uh, for Java Developer Journal, like when that was a thing years ago. Sure. Yeah, you and, can throw a link in. Yeah, I think it was the one of the few editorials that they actually made money on by releasing all the articles on Amazon for resale. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely enough. <laughs> OK. Uh, excellent. I am not looking at this YouTube video right now, Cameron. But yes, thank you for the link. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and actually, Flavio threw out like a totally reasonable thing here, which was uh, a, a tracking effects, because we were just talking about, you know, immutable and not the immutable. And I guess there's hiding for security versus hiding from yourself. And, 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 and then there's not being immutable. And OK, let me go look at this guy, because I'm doing some kind of effects tracking with my final field thing. Um, let me pull. Yeah, I think it, it's very interesting because you end up like, uh, there's this intersection between tracking unsafe codes or tracking things that are like null or defined. And these are all things that can be mapped to an effect system. So I think it's an interesting way of handling uh, those aspects of the language. Including non-termination? Yeah, you can, depending on the effect system, yes, you can track that. This is an, an, the blog post I, I shared is of a language that has a total effect uh, that is basically saying that it terminates uh, regardless of the inputs. Yeah, I'm just looking at somebody who's doing... How can we, how they deal with recursion? For example, Agda, uh, if you do a recursion in Agda, it, the compiler has to know that the recursion somehow terminates. Um, terminates yeah, uh, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. That uh, Agda right. assumes that will terminate. I was just reading yesterday, some guy doing, I want to say this is not the right blog post, but it's close doing algebraic subtyping, but one of the conversations was like, we're tracking termination and pure versus whatever. And what they did said was, we will approximate termination by claiming that we can recognize in the compiler that your recursion is reducing at every step. And therefore it will terminate eventually. But if we cannot tell that it's reducing, then we'll, we'll type it the other way. And, and in order to make a usable type system for a user who can add annotations or rely on Henley Milner style typing, the rules for which we recognize it's shrinking are fixed and stated ahead of time and well understood. Which one, which language? Is, is this? It was, uh, well, he was just doing on- Is that related to the Berkeley packet filter stuff, eBPF? No, but no, no, 
EBPF goes a different route. They, they say you can have loops, but they are defined as loops. And, and they have a constant bounds. Unroll it. I believe they unroll it. And, and then they unroll it because they see the yeah. constant bounds. Th this guy was doing pure lambda calculus. He's proving a theorem that says we can, in fact, prove that you have termination under some circumstances. We can't prove it always. So we're defining a language where you can clearly express a terminating loop construct, recursion that terminates. Um, but but not all things that terminate will be yeah. part of the language. Yeah, I had I had seen this in Agda. The problem in language that in, in uh, actor? they has the Agda. Oh, I, right. Agda. I yeah, yeah, it's a, throw it, throw it Okay, I will post it. It's a functional privilege in the Haskell like, but there has. The type system is a little different. I will post a link. Do I and Wobbler was involved in this pure thing as well. Damn it. I, was, I, I had it up in my tabs like yesterday or the day before. I was just reading it. Uh, I don't have it now. Fine. All right. So I can set a, have a set of rules that are guaranteed to terminate. But if I say for i in one two you in 64 max i can run for a very long time like well if you're just counting by plus one it'll be three billion ops a second times some billions of numbers it's done you're correct the goal of the pure lambda calculus was just to say we can check termination or not not performance whereas ebbf has a different rule which says not only can we check termination but we can check it in a constant time so they do what the what, well, what every hardware programming language on the planet does. They unroll. You go write VHCL or VHDL, one of those two, one of them, that, and you wrote a, a loopy thing. He unrolled your transistors. You had a wad of transistors, and he put time on the transistors, and he says, "And in so many nanos, your answer is out the back end." But you were flattened into a concrete, fixed size, two-dimensional structure. Yep. Oh, config languages that focus on being total. God, cat, I can't handle a cat being in and out, in and out, in and out. Holy moly. Or I leave the back door open and my back freezes and then I get muscle spasms from my back freezing. It's like stupid. We need to put rubber pads on his claws. It's, it's, it's fingernails on chalk. That, that's how he opens the back door. <laughs> Okay, okay, I have a first world problem here I'm whining about, fine. <laughs> uh, fine. All right, I will look at Agda again. Also later, I have, I'm drowning in the, the, the one I just threw out in the chat was- um, they, they have some interesting type systems that I, right. I, I do not claim I understand it all, but they have a, Fully dependent type system. That's something called a telescope. Blah blah blah. You you can read about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. And I I threw out one that was a guy doing. He claims lattice theoretic set theoretic types, which is very similar to what I'm doing, but I, I went a different direction that he did by a big ways. I certainly have union and intersection types floating around, and he stops there, and then he goes some deep theorem proving on it. And, and by getting rid of all the union intersection and going to constraints. And I'm in a different direction where I have very, very complicated type system that supports full a union intersection. Now, can I re-express everything as constraints and therefore get his bounds on provability of whatever? Maybe, I don't know. So that's my that's my homework problem for this week. So you, you in the AA language, you'll be able to express unions and sometimes as a core construct of the language. I, I, am, I am going back and forth on whether it's worth the trouble. Um, I, I have an implementation and the, the, the many, many things that you would otherwise use unions for, I get directly in the lattice without needing a union type. I have had union types, I have yanked them, I've had them back, I've yanked them, I've added them back, they might yet come back in again. They're at the what, moment out. What will be some? What will be a problem that embedding, uh, supporting the lattice, supporting the generics? Uh, what uh, problems you might stumble upon? For generics or union yeah. types? Uh, generics, generics. I believe the, the, they're different. The, yeah, I know they're different. Uh, okay. Just so, so um, the thing that I I don't get out of the lattice is I don't get type variables 
which let me express a constraint that you get on like a map call. Map takes a, a collection of A's and a function from A to B and returns you a collection of B's. I can't express that in the lattice because I can't express the concept of a collection of A's and also an argument from A to B because I can't tie the two A's together because I don't have type variables. So I can take a collection of int and a function from int to string. I can get a collection of a concrete thing and a, and a function from concrete thing to concrete thing. And I will specialize the map call and get those types done. But I have to specialize it every time, right? So if I want to pass map around, I have to pass around the host of maps that have all been specialized. And then I need a place where I do a selector on which map call, which entirely defeats the purpose, right? This is like not- Some not, secret not, stuff, some secret stuff. <laughs> no, no secret stuff, but just, it, it got ugly one step removed further out. So there's no solution, right? right now for that in your AA? I'm, I'm, I'm adding Henley Milner to AA. Oh, for that, to solve that? that. For exactly for that reason. Like okay. I can do subtyping in the lattice because subtypes in the lattice is subtyping in, in other languages, except I can have a, a lattice structure, not just a, a straight up subtyping. I haven't thought through if that's multiple inheritance or not. I don't want to go there. But subtyping works. I'm okay with subtyping. Um, I have a functioning working implementation. I say functioning, of course, nothing executes, but it types. I have a typable subtyping system running around. Um, so if I wanted if it to types, have a map ship it. where the values in the map were either strings or integers, could I do that? In uh, Henley Milner? No. In Lattice theory? Um, I, if I bring union types in, yes, but at the time you apply something, it has to take a function which takes int or string and does something useful with it, which probably means you have a runtime. I believe I you, like you said, you have, if you have the concrete types, you can express them. You just it, cannot express the generic type. Okay, just be, be careful here, right. There is, I have a collection which has ints or strings which any individual element is either an int or string in the same collection, as opposed to a collection of ints and a collection of strings, which I've typed as a thing, which is either all ints or all strings. So if I have just a thing that's all ints or all strings and I apply the map and the map takes a function from int or string to whatever, in the lattice theory world, I can specialize since I have just the map for ints and function from int to blah and a map of string, string to blah. Okay, that's not the case where you say I have a collection of a union type of inner string. So if I bring union types back in the lattice, I can say, yeah, you have a collection of inner string and every individual element is either int or string. And you can hand me a function of inner string to blah and I'll do the right thing. That'll type correctly. Um, but the map is not generic. It's specialized to inner string. And, and, and you, me can do it, you can do it with unions. No. I can do it with unions, yes. Yeah, yes. Henley Milner says the, the map is not specialized. So I can have one map call. It will work for interstring in a combination of union types and lattice theory. And Henley Milner would, would in fact let me do a straight up normal map, which takes interstrings and a function from interstring to blah and produce a collection of blahs at the far end. It will do the right thing. Oh, I think I've seen this Lambda cube before. That's probably a good answer. Let me let me let me go claim. The Lambda yeah. cubes categorizes the type systems. Uh, right, polymorphism, system some type operator. Yeah, and, F, right. Uh, Martin Loaf, Martin Loaf, the beginning of generic system F, system W, and so on. Right. Like. Okay. I I I claim that I'm somewhere sitting on that cube, but I don't know where. <laughs> My, my formal theory is like- If you don't know, have generics, you're below Martin Loaf, I believe. The type system of Martin Loaf, I, I, I believe that it ex, the first to express some kind of generics. Uh, the system F, I believe that can express a higher kind of types or system W. I, I don't know right, which right. one. And now what does lattice theory mean in terms of with union types mean with system W or you know F? I don't know. This is not my specialty. <laughs> Although I'm happy to go talk with people who is their specialty, they can tell me where I land in that cube. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Let me check, let me check. Good, please, feel free. 
yeah, yeah, fine. So at the moment, union types are out because they lend themselves to an n squared blow up of concrete type terms. Um, and I keep going back and forth because they're very convenient for doing various kinds of simple overloading. I haven't, I haven't nailed it down yet if it's worth like like small count of union types i'll just pay the n squared cost where n is two or three and I, I won't care and it'll blow up a little bit and be fine but the general union types can lead to very large type expressions also i do recursive types cyclic types um, which Henley Milner gives up on right away. You, you say that AA doesn't have a polymorphism yet. Yeah, I, d I don't have, well, when you, what do you mean by polymorphism? Let's make sure I don't have type variables. Yes, yes. But, uh, so I'm, I'm working on type variables. And I'm, according to me, and I'm not, and I, I don't claim any. Yeah, okay, fine. We're just, we're simply type lambda calculus. We're at the bottom of the line. With right, a, yeah, right. Right, yeah. except my types are a hell of a lot more complicated than the usual simply typed lambda calculus. So I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Like if it's simply types, but simple types include unions of int and string, is that simple type still? I, I don't know. I don't know. Just like I said, you will, you will be able to express more uh, complicated things with union types. Yeah, right. And I can get subtyping with the lattice theory as well. And is that still simply type? I, I don't know. I know Henley Miller will not do subtyping because there's some horrible, horrible issue you have there. I read that. Yeah, I, I read that they cannot express uh, subtyping. Right. And the, the link I threw out was some guy saying, we can do subtyping, except he has a very simple notion of subtypes. And, and he's doing a, a formal theoretic proof where he takes a trivial lambda calculus and a trivial set of, of subtyping kinds of things, mushes them together, removes the, the obvious thing with simple subtyping and turns it into a higher, uh, either in constraint, which I would call top and bottom level constraints, so lattice theory constraints, proves something about constraints. And that's where he gets- You can, the, you can check something called a bidirectional type checking. I don't believe what it's a type system. They they can implement the subtyping with the generics with almost all the functions of the lambda queue. <laughs> okay. I, I I will throw a link. Yeah, throw a link. Uh, get get more homework for me. All right, the cat in or out. Do you have to do anything special to ensure that your type assertions get eliminated, or will they go away with normal dead code where you're like? They oh, go with one normal. of the paths of this branch is dead because it will always be this type. So yeah, they go um, away with dead code. First, I prove all the types. Then I show that the type assertion is a is a dead test, is, is a trivial test. It's implemented by throwing into the IR. If not the type that you asked for, fail the compilation with a typing error. And then I just prove types until I have a trivial if test that's trivially false, I throw it away without any further ado. Is there a way to get that information out of the compiler if I wanted to do something like what, what color information? the text in my editor based on whether the assertion got removed or not? Yeah, if the assertion did not get removed, you have a typing error. It's strongly typed, it's not a runtime test. So if you fail to remove a type assertion, you get a typing error at typing time before runtime. Is that special to types or can I make an arbitrary assertion in my code that if the compiler can't prove is dead, that it will throw an error? Yeah, and a lot of languages do that. They have a fail, fail a compilation, right? And then you put it in a macro and the macro expands and folds away and the fail disappears or it doesn't. Uh, I know that various flavors of C I've used over the years have had this kind of a thing. So this so is- fail is as simple as if this piece of code isn't dead, the compilation has failed. And then you put it in any arbitrary if that you like, because it's just yeah. a piece of code. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to say te uh, C++ templates do this. Um, some C macro flavors I've used to do this. Like, like if you put a fail, uh, uh, special form is a special syntactic form, basically. 
in the language and the compiler runs across it, the obvious thing is you just fail immediately with a fail. If you use macros, then it never appeared or did according to how the macro expansion went. So you get your typing done by the macro expansion went the right way or it didn't. So if you're acting like Java and you're compiling at runtime, that has no Java doesn't assert. Again. Java asserts are, are like C asserts. This is a runtime test that, if executed, will fail, or what does whatever the test does, and the the test is strongly guaranteed to be removed if the assertion is turned off. But it doesn't tell you that the assertion, if it's in there, got folded away by the compiler or not. And it's a runtime test. Maybe it's in there. So you do not have in Java a way to say, here's a complicated thing. Tell me if it's true or false at compile time. You're either in or out of the language typing system, so you get a type error. Or because a lot of a lot of things that compiler can prove won't happen, he proves using runtime information that is not available at typing time. You've never made a subclass of class X ever since the VM started. Therefore, this test will always fail and I can throw it away or whatever. It's always dead. I can toss it. And this is true up until you load a subtype of X and then I have to blow up and try again. So, so it right. assumes the most that it would be convenient Sorry. in a world like that to have something in your language that says can fa fail at build time, essentially. Yeah. So even though at runtime I instantiated that class, the fact that I instantiated that class means this assumption no longer works, means that I now have a right. die on build in my code, and you can tell right. me a little bit earlier. Right. See, Not see. I died at runtime, but I died at compile time, even if that right. compile is a JIT event. C, C++ have this. AA has this. The, there is a program language called Jai that also has a compile time evaluation. It's a, it's not open source, but uh, it's this is uh, Jonathan blows. Yes, yes, yes. It has a, a pretty cool ideas, I think. To throw the link. Oh, okay, compile, sure. time, compile time only annotation. So Scala has an annotation for this for the behavior you're looking for. Yeah. So you're saying, give me an arbitrary expression. The compiler proves it some very early point. In, in the case of Java, jitting time has a lot more information than at Java C time. You're asking for at Java C blow up. Yeah, I just want to know as early as possible. Yeah. If you can tell me at static ahead of time time, great. If you can't, but you can tell me at jit time, great. If you what? can't, but you can tell me at runtime, great. If right. you yeah. fail utterly and the thing just has incorrect right. behavior, that's not so great. So the the some of the languages have it at ahead of time compilation, and everybody has it at runtime as an assertion, and very few people have it at JIT time. I don't know if anyone has it at JIT time, which is an interesting breakpoint. And yeah, we call time, that we call that link we call it linking link time. time. Yeah, it's not a bad way to do it. Link time. Yeah. So because comp we we refer to compilation as compilation from source to IR. Link time is the closure over the type system at which time you can yeah. you can prove many more things. Yeah, yeah, it's true. The the Java JIT is a little bit later and can prove more things, but you have tiers of jitting. This could, your, your test could be not provable by compiler one, by tier one, and yes, provable by tier two. And now okay, it's, it's both later and earlier in a sense, because in the Java JIT case, you still haven't discovered the type system. Yeah, so you're talking linking as a complete closed world binary. Yeah, Java does incremental linking. Right. He's always, and it never closes, he's always incrementally adding more link time things. Yes, yes. So in that sense, it's halfway into the linking step, but you're only ever halfway into the linking yes. step. There's yet universe yet to discover. Yet to discover. Right, but it gets you the potential to reject a link. If you have some kind of JIT time assertion, you'd say, add this yeah. class to my world. Yeah. And then I hit a thing and that was required to be dead, but wasn't dead. And I go, no, I'm not going to add this add class yeah, to my yeah. world. The class you're trying to add to my world breaks my assertions. Right. No, I, I'm, I'm totally good with the usefulness of this concept. I'm just claiming it doesn't currently exist in any known big common implementation. Maybe there are some pieces, some funny languages that do it. 
I concur that the macros uh, run uh, compile time macros, as we say it in Scala, is a pretty powerful feature, and uh, any new language should consider having. I'm, I'm trying to do with AAs to not need compile time macros. Yeah, my argument is macros are great in assembly, they were great in C, and beyond that, they're evil. So, yeah, but, but in C, but in C, most string string based, the the type system cannot participate too much in the macros. I'm sorry, I should have added Lisp. Lisp yeah, as well. Yeah, I'll so. take Rust and Lisp macros over C's macros. I agree. I agree. I have, I have done Lisp macros. About what C macros are going to do, including like include. They were they were they were painful. Lisp macros. I, I mean, in long term coding, understand what the hell's going on after you did macros or while you were doing macros. That was tough. Now, I also see people who do like um, quoted code, right? Here's, a, here's an eval expression, except I have holes I'm going to fill in. Now, is that a macro? Maybe. Is it typable up to the limit of what you fill in the holes? Maybe. Is it a coding style that I want to encourage? I don't know. I'm doing something vaguely similar in H2O deserializer code, where I basically have a Here's a pile of serialization code, except I have to fill in all the class for names and I have to fill in all the field names. Uh, is that a macro? Mm -hmm. Was it useful? Well, yeah. Was it difficult to understand after the fact? A little bit. Deserializer had a very narrow set of things. I've seen people do funny games like query expansion for SQL after the query plan turned into Here's a wad of boilerplate when we fill in query bits and then we pop it off as a pile of code and go jit it. And, JSON uh, serializer is a very good candidate for- There you go, yes, group. yes, absolutely. And I look at the serializers you get out of Elm for JSON deserializing and they are a pain in the butt to understand and use. They have some sort of elegance in the, in the theory and design, but the actual use of them is pain in the neck. This not, not obvious. Fine. Also one, one correction for the uh, description of the coffee compiler club is I don't think the coffee is optional. It should be mandatory. Um, well, some days we're a little faster moving and some days a little slower. And I always finish my coffee within the first 15 minutes because I sat down an hour ago. Oh, fine. Sorry, I'm getting graduation notices from for one of my kids now. So I was thinking about something you said a few weeks ago around you could use C2 as an ahead of time compiler for Java, but you just wouldn't get very far because you don't know what classes are going to be loaded because you can load a yeah. class at any time. Yeah. Yeah, Do you, you think it make makes sense for a language to distinguish different times and say, oh, language. when I have a new module, I'm going to have a essentially compile time thing that I call and an init time thing that I call and then a main and say, you might want to call just the import parts of all the modules and try and find a large amount of the code that's going to get imported. There, there's certainly, you know, in Java, you have, uh, there's a, there's a, it exists moment, but I didn't link it. There's a linked, which I can reference, but I haven't initialized it. I ran the seal on it. And then the class is like fair game. And then, you know, Jitting, by the way, jitting interleaves horribly in that plan because if your seal init runs long running big loops, you want to jit in the seal init. So the jit actually supports compiling methods in a class that has not been initialized. Because people do that. And there's even a theory that says it's a reasonable thing to do in a bunch of cases. So do you want to say jitting as a performance hack is an exposed thing in the language where I ask for it in different places. This is like an inline or a register keyword. It's a performance hack. Then there is a, I'm doing jitting because I want to have a more stronger analysis of whatever language is going on so I can verify types. I claim that's a typing thing. And that should be part of your typing system and not 
not separable. It's like modules invoke typing at some point. When I load the module for the first time, and you know, Cameron's world, he has a closed type system. He, he that's the point at which you declare, yeah, I know something about types. Does that answer your question or did Yeah, it does. Okay. I'm just always constantly wondering with the like snapshot idea, how far can I go in my VM before I'm ready to say, okay, it's time to serve the first request from the network from a user. Oh. Like uh -huh. even if it takes me five minutes to start my VM, but I get reasonably performant code out the back end once I start serving some traffic. I, I think that the JIT experience says you want to start profiling. So you want to start running as soon as possible. Yeah, once I have profile data, I probably want to recompile everything using and the profile You can't data. get profile data to you start running. Right, this so is, this is the- Spending a lot of effort to get the ahead of time compiled to be efficient because you're going to have to recompile everything with the profile data anyway. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But you want an efficient compiler. Whether or not you use it ahead of time is different. You want a fast yeah. compiler. What about the profile guided optimization. Uh, well, exactly. It tries, to guess, it tries to guess what will happen. <laughs> exactly what, right. Exactly what the profiling does is let you do profile guided optimization. So you have a JIT that assumes profile guided optimization from the get go, from the start with reasonable profiles. Now, can I hand you profiles that I've recorded from the past and have you start on the JITing? Maybe this is what we need. Where's Arthur? Arthur Arthur's been doing this now. Darn it. That's very funny. I just think about very different approaches. V8 tends to compile my code after it's been run three times, whereas C2 seems to compile my code after it's been run like 10,000 times. Yeah, I picked that 10,000 number 25 years ago. No one's changed it. It was a good number. I can't, I can't buy back compilation time after three go rounds. The fastest C1 uh, internal, whatever, Shun's fastest JIT would not pay back for a thousand iterations. But 10,000 C2 would pay back. So you could get an so even. If you do it 10,000 times, it's probably hot. Yeah. Furthermore, you also experience a larger variety of rare events. Yeah. So the JIT can see the most complete picture it can. See, it sees a more complete picture, yeah, yeah. Once you do the heavyweight JIT, do you stop counting things? Or is there still a sense of like? The heavyweight JIT does not, in its last tier, does not emit counters. You could argue that it should emit some counters that it can use as a cheap approximation of what goes on. But you have to keep the cost really low really low because that's the reason you're there. Furthermore, you already know the runtime is tremendous. So you can always just count the false paths as well. So you have yeah. assumptions that say this is this is the optimal path and then yeah. just count the ones where you, you're not right. You guessed wrong. You want to count the rare paths because they're rare so it's cheap. So Cameron, when you walk away, the the poor Zoom face recognition can't find you anymore. So he draws a line on your background at my bright light of the door that you photographed a month ago. And I see your actual office space on half and my room from you know three months ago on the other half. So there was a red wall with a little wall sconce and a switch pretty close in the background behind you. I don't know what you're talking about, Cliff. You're sitting right here next to me. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So Cliff, um, I actually have changed the compiler setting on on occasions, so like the compiler count. We yeah, backed flip it. Down. Yeah, we backed it down from ten thousand. Uh huh. Um, uh, because of uh, the uh, the decay feature um, on the counters. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're finding that uh, like if you're running hot, things compile really nicely, but if you're running slightly less than hot. Uh -huh. um, then things weren't being compiled because the decay was kicking in before you tripped the threshold. Oh, yeah. Can, I mean, it, it, can you, someone, explain decay? I, I assume yeah, what yeah. it is, but explain it. I, I asked for no decay, and it was no decay for a long time. That That's where you age counters. So something is hot enough to jet only if it's hot in a window of time. 
if you don't decay, then the counts ever accumulate and you end up jitting almost everything that ever executes eventually, which I claim so is right, actually- it's right. So yeah, it's yeah. a sliding windows of hot cold. Yeah. Right, right. Suppose I have something that's really hot, it jits right away, fine. Suppose I have something that's running once a second. Well, it takes 10,000 seconds to hit 10,000 counts and then you jit it. But I claim that's still the right answer. I would claim it's the right answer also. So we've either turned decay off or, or lowered the thresholds in a number of occasions where you have like, uh, like main deployments and satellite deployments and you're seeing like slowness in the satellite deployments because uh, you know, the, the compiler's just not kicking in. Yeah, uh, because of decay. Yeah, 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 uh, I, claim, I, I claim no decay. Right. Yeah, you don't get a scale down. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that you don't get a scale down uh, effect with uh, with the decay. Yeah, so it's like every 30 seconds they check a handful of counters and if you've gone past, I forget what the threshold is now, I haven't looked at it in a while, but when you go past that threshold, then they'll knock the counter value by half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which means that you can get almost to 10,000 and then you get cut and then you get almost to 10,000 and then you'll get cut. And... Right. It, it puts a hard threshold on your frequency and below that frequency, you never get it. Yeah. I, I guess in, the, in long running applications, if you have things that are just called infrequently, eventually it will get compiled because of that. So, right. So, so one mm -hmm. of the things I'm going to argue Playing devil's advocate, the argument for counter decay is that the endless jitting causes you to accumulate code indefinitely. Yes. And is that useful? And back in the day, there was actually an issue with managing lifetime of code that was problematic. And life got better via variety of engineering efforts over time and managing very large volumes of code is not such a problem anymore. And memories just got bigger. And well, memory, yes. So that was, yeah, you, you I didn't have trouble so running out of memory being held for the jitted code per se, just like managing the, the code. You had to do GC things with it all the time. You had to age it out if it was dead, dead. If you want to get rid of a piece of jitted code and you've made the fastest possible path from jitted to jitted code happen and you're using inline caches, that combination makes it extremely difficult to get rid of code ever. Not impossible, just very difficult. It is un, unclear, unobvious when it is legal. Like the first thing you do is you say, well, of course I, I slap a, 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 a stop me now at the head of the code I think is dead and shouldn't be executed. Okay, fine. Yeah, and no I don't want to claim I, I got rid of it by getting rid of all call sites, including all inline caches except that I can have loaded the bits in the CPU registers and had the OS take a page fault, flop a guy out, flop him back in the next millennium later and continue execution. And he'll have already passed the inline cache check and he'll have to go there. So- I have a question. Uh, does the JIT counts are per method? Does the JIT counts are only method? Fine, fine brain in that. Yeah. So see the, the low level, the interpreter only counts back edges and per method. Yeah. The first well, year can, compilation. Can, can, okay, so oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the first I, I was in the question. Okay. Oh. I thought you were where where is counting happening? For first yeah, year yeah. okay, first tier compilation counts all control flow. So all basic block branches, and you use the, there's okay. a Lars Ball paper from many years ago, optimize your counters. Oh, you optimize your counters a little bit. Because you're doing it in jitted code, you can count efficiently. You cannot count efficiently in the interpreter without being really gruesome. It's ugly in the interpreter. As soon as you do any jitting at all, you can count efficiently. Okay, so you count efficiently in the first tier compilation. Second tier compilation doesn't count except by accident on all paths where he says, and here I die. And therefore I flip to the interpreter and I, I, I will count. And, and usually that's a heroic optimization and you definitely count the heroic optimization fails. Yeah, my question is that uh, the JIT can some count something like a call graph. Uh, these set of functions are called together so they can be jitted more aggressively together, something like that. When you JIT, you go through a bunch of heuristics to pick the starting point and your inlines. So it's a method size JIT you always triggered a compilation at some leaf function, a, a fucking getter. 
the interpreter is counting getters just like any other method. So he counted the getter, the getter flipped. Okay, you don't want to jit a getter. You want to jit where the getter inlines into. So you walk the call stack looking for a frequency break in the execution of methods. And you say, okay, this is a good point. So I start here. Now I want to inline down to the getter I came from. Plus I want to inline people according to frequency and you, you, you do a frequency expansion. You take the, the most hottest thing and inline it and then what he inlines and you keep a work list until you decide you have enough stuff. And then you, you go to town. That was for the state before I left. Okay. Sorry. So it has okay. some kind of heuristic to expand the window, what window to catch of the execution to yeah. how JIT is efficient. Yeah, it's called inlining. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's called inlining. Yeah. yeah and, and inlining has gotten more sophisticated since I left because yeah. I knew at the time it wasn't the right thing. You want to do a better thing where you inline during the optimizer because the optimizer can come to a point that says, and here this V call went to several locations and they all have reasonable counts and I went inline some of them, whatever. But here I prove that in fact, I'm only looking at direct byte buffer, not heat byte buffer. And therefore mm -hmm. I want this one guy having inline direct byte buffer. I now see immediately different sets of counts and I want to inline again kind of thing, right? There, there's, a, there's a smarter inlining strategy. And I know it was done at Sun after I left. I know Arthur's been working on it and, I, and somebody's just put, Flavio put it in here that Grawl was doing a thing as well. Yeah, Graal does this quite differently. They do more tracing. So it's like per thread traced rather than stack frame based. Um, yeah, and there's a few other points. The, the small method, like anything less than six byte codes gets stripped out pretty quickly. That's like- uh, Yeah, yeah, T2 has it, uh, 250, the, yeah, the compile threshold is 250. Right, if you're, if you're exactly certain patterns, like a getters, they're always 100% every time. If yeah. you're under six or under eight, some really small threshold, the threshold is also really tiny. Yeah. But then as you get bigger, we use, yeah, yeah. Similar. Does it just duplicate some methods or you have to specialize it if it's yeah. inline? Inlining is exactly duplicating a method. Okay, cool. And, and therefore specializing it for the code in question. So the answer is 100%. You may have been asking about uh, generic types or something. Right, right. Well. There's another There's version that says at, yes, the, yes, or the generic at the dispatch yeah. point, I could dispatch to methods that have different signatures that had the same signature, but I've specialized for different types. Right, this one's taking capital I integer, and this one's taking capital P person, and this one's taking capital what, blah, 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 blah. That mm -hmm. is not done because it requires the caller to choose a different dispatch. Right. Instead, and that's a we, good one to do, though. That's a huge optimization that's been left on the table, we, because because as you back up the call stack, right? So you're at a million, a million, a million, a million, ten thousand. You're like, fuck, yeah. there it is, right? Yeah. So ten thousand to a million. I'm going to take the cost at that point yeah. of manually selecting a a branch path. Yeah. Based on, so it's like I see person, 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 int, int, int. You know, whatever. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna compile down from here, specialize for person, compile down from here, specialize yeah. for int, and leave a default path for everything else. And, and let the I claim the, the existing heuristics do that. They do. They do it a different that, way. That was my question. Thank you. They, they, they go the one step up and said, I'm calling from the ten thousand to the million, and I look at the set of targets I have. And if a set of targets is small, I make a bunch of decisions, including test for person and inline the person piece, test for this and inline this guy. There is breakout, uh, an, an, an instance of tree that then does the runtime test and branches to versions of these things. There's uh, uh, inline some set of them and V call the rest. There, there's a bunch of things there. So it's not 100% that but I get that effect in most cases and suddenly the performance gains are more modest for what you would get if you did a generic uh, uh, V call like dispatch logic at the target point. So I didn't want to go in and change the dispatch logic in the virtual machines runtime state to understand I have multiple implementations of a method that are not just generically swappable one for another. Right now, the multiple implementations are all the flavor of this one's faster than that one, this is valid and this one's not. So there's several of them there. There's ones that you can continue executing if you're in it already, but you cannot call again. There's this one's a C1 versus a C2 or a stub to the interpreter. Those are just performance difference. 
Um, and there's another one or two floating around. There's one, so I'm hanging on to it because I have to, but no one can ever execute any bytecode in ever again, but I can't get rid of it because someone can jump to it. Those are, those are also hanging around. And what you're asking for is when I do a generic jump, like an inline cache, like an inline cache doesn't support this because it goes to the V table, does a class compare check and then jumps to the right target. So at the time that you want to do this, I'd have to validate that the inline cache can only be receiving the correct certain types of arguments. Then his direct target goes to the specialized version. So, you know, in theory, it could be done, but now my inline cache has to have certain knowledge. And if you lose that knowledge, like you subclass person, I have to blow out the inline cache. And right now I blow out the target person code, but not the inline cache is pointing to the target person code. So the, the, it, it could be done. I, I'm claiming I get nearly all of that effect already, but not all of it. Compiler gets that information, but I feel like the developer doesn't. That's correct. Like I often want some way where I can go ping all of my VMs and say, give me your performance counters in a way that I can map back the, the source. Azul... So that I can say, yes. look at this symbol. What types does this symbol become? Is it megamorphic? The look Azul at this block. KPM. Is it in hot code? Look at this block. <laughs> this block is not dead, but also never actually runs in production. I have to break for a moment because my wife's leaving for the weekend. So we're going to go off camera for our PD. <laughs> So um, I can help you with that one. Actually, uh, you can get that type of information. Uh, uh, there's some uh, diagnostic logging that you can turn on, which will pr produce uh, logs from the JIT compiler. And it'll um, tell me things like this call site is megamorphic. Uh, well, you'll get uh, yeah, you'll get you'll get a whole bunch of reasons why a particular piece of code was not inlined, or you know why it was treated the way that it was. Um, you know the log files are. Um, not easy to read by hand, by eye, just eyeballing the log. So um, I typically use a tool called JitWatch um, to, uh, to, to look at it. Um, mostly what I've been focusing on recently is, is uh, memory optimization. So what I'd be looking for are, uh, you know, like uh, you get allocation site re uh, reductions or, or eliminations and, um, and you'd be looking for reasons why you might not get a, a, a wanted uh, allocation site reduction uh, or but, something. But you have to guess it. Uh, you said you'd use uh, some JIT profile. You have well, to you guess actually, it. Why. You, you it would be cool to just guess. call me this site. Is it meg megamorphic or no? Yeah, but you don't have to guess. It'll, it, it'll come in and it'll, it'll tell you, right, that, you know, that, it, that your, your polymorphic uh, call site can't, you know, there's can't be, it, didn't in line. Yeah, it can't be reduced. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Shouldn't the VM just take care of all that for you and optimize those for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what it's doing. It'd be better if we had, poly, you know, but. like polymorphic inlining, but, um, um, somebody has got to do the work. So I think we had some people working on it or looking at it, but, um, uh, that work has not really been, it's been dropped and not picked up. So, so they give me information like which basic blocks are responsible for what percentage of yeah. the branch mish predicts or cache yes. misses or cache contestants. Yes. Yeah, the Azul the could totally do that back yeah. in the day. And they switched to Falcon. I don't know if they're going to have it, but I had a freaking browser interface on a JVM and all those performance counters came out. And they came out nicely annotated and lumped in with the code and everything else. Yeah, so I don't... A basic block. What's a basic block after you've done 15 layers of inlining? Well, it belonged to some method that was specialized and specialized and specialized, specialized, specialized. So it, 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 it's not easy to blame it back the correct way. But yeah, you... Watch does that actually, Cliff. I'm sorry, what does? Jitwatch? Jitwatch will do that. Okay. And it shows you the AST trees, compilation decisions, hmm. you know, like a bazillion different. Okay, yeah. Is this is it what is this on what what rev do you have to be to use this? Because I've uh, it's long time. I, I don't know. I've been using it for since JDK seven, I guess. Till no, uh, it wasn't doing this info in JDK seven. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is yeah. now. Yeah, it is. Uh, j yeah, you just dump the 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 hotspot logs and and. Um, Show it the code and show it the log. Oh, you run the logs through. Like I looked at JitWatch way back in the day and it was pathetic compared to the Azul VM, but the Azul VM, I just went behind a paywall and 
fine. Well, fine. Uh, your watch is much better than today. Okay, fine. Yeah, Chris has done a lot of work on it, so. Cool, yeah. Yeah, all that information, I mean, JVM has it. So what I heard Cameron say is, you should optimize it, the JIT should optimize it. And yes, but when it doesn't, what do you do? For the same reason we have inline and register keywords back in C code, right? You know, yeah. you should, but you don't. So what the hell do you do? Oh, go get, yes, good luck. Boy, my, I got hammered for my vaccine, but it's done. I got the Johnson one and done. Oh God, it, it, just it, with us. It, it hammered the shit out of me for 24 hours and then and then I'm done. Uh, I got my first shot. Did you have week. a slight fever? Did you have a slight fever? I had fevers and chills. I, well, I rarely ever get sick. Like literally every five years, I get sick one day in five years. Okay. When I get sick, it's generally the flu and generally I get fevers and chills and I am a miserable baby for a day. <laughs> and that's what happened to me. I had fevers and chills. I had trouble sleeping. I was mainlining ibuprofen and Tylenol. I was curled up under the blankets, you know, shivering and sweating and shivering and sweating and then back so, and forth. Yeah, one of the reasons why you get such an extreme reaction to the vaccination is that you've already had COVID. <laughs> Maybe. Like I said, I rarely, I, I like, like, Every maybe yeah. every five years I get a mild flu and that's it. And no one, everyone else gets it around me all the time. And I, I, I so, bounce it, bounce it hard. Just yeah. got my first shot yesterday, and the the worst problem so far is my arm's a little sore where the needle went in. That's yeah, my it. arm was sore for three or four days, but the flu like flu like symptoms from the, from the vaccine like my, four days. my son has COVID right now. Yeah, like actually has it. Yes, but basically no symptoms. So, oh. Ooh, but he's that's, gonna... that's that's why I'm not in my office. My office is is uh, quarantined right now. Uh, your office is quarantined, or you are quarantined from the office. I thought you were in Cliff's office. Yeah, <laughs> I have the vaccines. Okay. Well, yeah. Long story. Keith, were you able to get it because um, you're in one of the hot zones in Ottawa? No, I'm turning 60 this year. That's how I got uh, it. That's how I got mine too. Uh, I had 55 to 60 or 40. The Oakland Coliseum is a freaking ginormous Coliseum here. I don't know people live in the Bay Area know this thing. You drove to Oakland Coliseum. You signed up. They gave you an hour window. You you showed up. Huge pile of cars pull off the freeway. Cops everywhere. Lights, lights, lights. You drive through the parking lot in a zigzag. Mm -hmm. Check your license, check your barcode, QR code, check this, check that. At different stations that you drove for it, it was fast. I was there no more than 30 minutes, including the 15 after the shot. Like five to 10 going through the parking lot. They put a hundred of us under a giant tent in 10 rows of 10 deep. They asked all the same questions. They had two nurses per car. They popped both passenger and driver in seconds. They waved us all forward into lines in the lot. We waited for 15 minutes for an adverse reaction and then they, they flagged you on. It was 30 minutes in and out of the lot and they were doing a hundred people a minute. It was only an hour for me from leaving my home. Yeah. To waiting a f five minutes to get into the building, you know, getting the shot, waiting 15 minutes to make sure I'm okay and 15 minutes to drive home and yeah, all done. Yeah. yeah. I'll probably get it about September, I'm guessing at this point. Yeah. Even though I'm not very far from Keith, uh, I won't be getting it anytime soon if our no, vaccination. Buff, what was that, Keith? You're just a young one. Yeah, I guess my beard says uh, <laughs> otherwise. Yeah, we'll but, get his uh, beard, but you know, uh, but you still got brown hair. See, I, I'm, I'm long turned uh, salt pepper hair. It, it, it's disappearing and gray, but it, it, I like the way it looks in the video. It doesn't look as gray as it does in real life. Ah, uh, Zoom <laughs> doing a little, little magic touch up for you behind your back. <laughs> exactly. I'm running that other new Zoom filter that makes you look not gray. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me look like a, a cat, like the lawyer doing the cat on <laughs> Zoom. I gotta say, 100 vaccines a minute is pretty good throughput. But on the other hand, it's a deeply pipeline process where all the branches are rarely taken. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good, good, okay. good analogy. But they got it going. I mean, it, we're, we're getting some huge kind of vaccines a day now. Nice. All right. All right. Maybe this is a good break point. We seem to have wandered off from branch prediction and inline caching and 
I guess we were also asking, can the is there a way to have the runtime tell the programmer what the observed runtime experience is? And wouldn't that be nice if that were a more officially supported thing? In particular, that, they tie back to lines of code so that my developer in the editor can look at something. Well, that's what I was commenting about. I, I gave you, I would give you hardware more, counter yeah. annotations on the jitted code along with the Java line numbers and field types and structure types. And because of deep inlining, what you got for counts for one particular method on one arm would be different from that same method inline somewhere else. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like you can go back to your, your IntelliJ and say this method, I, I give you summary counts. I, I, I would have to give you summary counts if I say this method. What the JIT work on is highly precisioned counts for a particular inline path. And that's the question you want your developers to have in front of them, because now the JIT's already taken his best effort at doing the right thing. And the developer needs to see that piece to know where to take the program to the next step. So yeah, Cliff, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that- more uh, interesting to annotate than the definitions of the functions. Uh, it, it's all the nested inline call sites. I'm getting here, yeah. All right. Sorry, Kirk. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying that JitWatch gives you all of this. It's not coupled into an IDE, but it actually gives you a lot of the, all of these this information to give you the assembly the reports. Yeah, absolutely. So, if I mean, if you have something being inlined into different things, then it yeah. it'll treat all of those things differently, yeah, and it organizes that information for you Did really, that. really nicely. Yeah. And I I don't think you'd really want to look at this on a oh I'd like to know what the count is for that particular method anyways, because um, I don't think that would be a useful way of looking at the problem because if you're just like randomly cherry picking methods yeah. for random reasons, then it's very likely you're just gonna come up with random results. Well, I'm claiming you optimize the method based on, you know, profile for where it's at. Bingo. Strategy, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. just been working with a client doing performance work on a big complicated thing or doing and, uh, you know, Step one was always, all right, break out the inline path from what the generic everybody uses from this hot thing and inline it manually. Now we can customize it ourselves in a way that JIT's not doing. Yeah, there's another issue here that you have to play with, right? It's that um, all the optimizations are highly sensitive to uh, whatever pressure is putting on, whatever pressure is being put on the application. And if you don't mimic that uh, precisely, you're very likely going to get completely different optimization paths, yeah. Um, yeah. which means that um, you know th these are things you really want to drag out of production environments and not test environments. Yeah, you right. can only optimize in production, unfortunately. Yep. Yeah, that's you can only optimize these things in seeing the data coming from production environments. Yeah. Yeah. That's why environments. Archer would have been handy on this call because that's uh, that that's both the uh, I mean it's the same approach we're designing for, but it's also the approach that Azul took. We drag those out of, of every, we never turned off the profiling and we never turned off the ability to get out. So your production VM would always have that profile yeah. data. We just lowered the cost of profiling to where it was you know, under 1% on the hot shit, it, it disappeared. Which is true, but not standard. I feel like a lot of developers are doing their performance optimizations based on, it used to take me one second to run all of the tests and now it takes me 1.1 seconds to run the unit tests. I broke something. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's an uh, issue with people not understanding how to do performance analysis work. I, I, you know, I think Kirk and I, a lot of people here are actually old hats at this. So, uh, you know, and I would even claim that just focusing on execution profiling, like a continuous profiling, yeah. is um, um, misguided uh, because it really leaves you blind to a whole host of issues um, that you simply can't see um, uh, when you're execution profiling. Um, there's actually I need to I, I need to dig some stuff up on some people I saw do some really interesting bring uh, it next CPU profiling bring something next time because you, you've talked about this stuff before but it's hard without seeing a, a concrete well, and you've showed me some concrete instances that are obvious right well I mean like okay so one of the common patterns you see evolving today because of microservices architecture is what I call a revolving door which means like I'm in and out on a service bang really fast. It's just bang, 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 bang through, right? So very, very small units of work being executed by 
um, uh, by service. And the fun part of all of that is that um, the bottleneck in that system turns out to be the thread scheduler. Yeah. And then like people pack because they can't, uh, you know, to like basically burn more CPU. Uh, but because you're now being throttled by the thread scheduler, it means like you're idling cores because of that. People think, oh, well, I'm only using like 30%, 40% core. I can like pack more in here, like pack them up, right? They don't realize that, you know, what they're doing is they're just adding pressure onto the thread scheduler, which is like further slowing everything down. You're dying from, from context switch costs. So I'll add more unrelated right. costs yeah, to you, the same you box. Basically, yeah, you basically have exhausted, uh, like each of the cores that has a, like a work queue schedule can like blow through it like yeah. quick, very quickly. And then it's idled waiting for the thread scheduler to catch up to it. Yeah. And that's because, you know, people who use microservices should be shot. That's, um, that's uh, let's not go that far. But, <laughs> but, they have, but they have money and they're willing to pay consultants. So, so don't say oh, oh, I see. I'm sorry. Gotcha. Right. And of course, from I mean, Amazon's point of view, you're just burning cores. So yeah, it's all good. Right. Yeah. But okay. So this problem is like, like trivial to see. You can see it within about 15, 20 seconds of getting your eyes onto the yeah. system. Right. Yeah. Um, it's trivial, but um, you'll never see it with an execution profiler. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Never, never, because you no. Know, I mean, my analogy here is like you're like a you know, you know like a I don't know like a square rigger, right? Without just throwing rope and knotted rope into the sea, measuring how fast you're going, not really realizing you're on a Gulf Stream. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not visible to the things that are happening, you know, that you'd like, you're in this thing, you can see what's happening within that context, but there's a greater context that right. you completely yeah. miss. And you, yeah. yeah. Eventually those sailors figured that out, but it, it took them a while. Right. Well, you know. <laughs> you cross the Atlantic go. one side, north and south, and the other side, the other way. I mean, all they really had to do was use GPS and they could have told. Exactly. Why didn't they use GPS from the start? Billy morons. Billy sailors. I think, we're, I think we're far, far beyond where we need to be here. <laughs> all right. I want to claim victory. Victory for the Alliance here. And, and had a good time. And I just got a butt ton of reading to do here. So um, good fun. See everybody next week. Okay, guys. Cheers. 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 Bye. See you next time. Bye.